Senate approves the 2024 to 2026 medium term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper. NMPC Limited CEO tells lawmakers when importation of PMS will end. And later on the program, they gave us the major components of some of the major instruments of war that they had to purchase. And then when you donate it into Naira and into dollar, it becomes very insufficient. I'll speak to the lawmaker representing a Jeremy Ifelodun federal constituency in Lagos State, Paul Kalejaye. You're watching the Hello Chambers on TVC News. I am Tijesu Adewi. The Nigerian Senate has passed the 2024 to 2026 medium term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper. The lawmakers approved the document that projects 26 trillion naira as federal government's total expenditure for next year, with a borrowing plan of 7.8 trillion naira for 2024 and a budget deficit of 9 trillion naira. The federal government's commitment to progressively restructure the debt portfolio towards achieving a balanced domestic to external debt ratio is evident in the 2024 to 2026 MTEF and FSP. A significant number of the federal government's revenue generating agencies engage in arbitrary, frivolous, and extra budgetary expenditure. Over 100 young people who had undergone tech talent and data science training at the SAIL Innovation Lab have gotten decent artificial intelligence job with Awari AI, a fast-growing AI robotic firm that is enabling the development and adoption of frontier technology on the African continent, starting from Nigeria. The firm, which has chosen the SAIL Innovation Lab in Ikorodu as a launch pad to several locations in Nigeria and Africa, also partnered with the SAIL Innovation Lab for continuous talent sourcing for the emerging multi-billion dollar AI industry that is expected to shape all spheres of life in a few years from now. The co-founder of the SAIL Innovation Lab, the senator representing Lagos East Senatorial District, Senator Adeto Kumbo Abiru, says the launch of the partnership with Awari AI signals the beginning of a transformative journey in Ikorodu and Lagos East Senatorial District as a whole. It's actually to create a platform within my own senatorial district, you know, to a, a platform that can, you know, reposition and help and reskill our young young folks who are, who are out of university or out of technical colleges, but without the technical skills that today's world require. So that is what we have deliberately set up here. And in doing it, the starting point was to create the facility. And after having created the facility, what we have done next is to look for a partner that can also provide the faculty. That is what um, CC Hub, that's co-creation hub has done. So this facility you see here, right, is managed by them and so they handle all of the trainings that we, we, we inculcate in the young folks. So we have the likes of um, tech talent and for those who have been around and moved, moved around with us, we also have STEM, which is the science, technology and um, engineering and mathematics. So what we are doing is deliberately preparing our young folks to meet the challenges of the future and to be properly positioned so that they can be employable, so that they can also be entrepreneurial. So the, the, the greatest joy for me today is that, you see, in all that we have done also, as we teach them without, you know, without charging them anything, we also, the expected out, outcome is also to create jobs for them. A very special day for Ikorodu, that Ikorodu can be the host of that initial workforce, but also that SAIL as well can be the home for the workforce. I think what we're going to see here is practical demonstration of what AI means. We'll start to see its application in society. But as we also see the application in society as well, let's consider the fact that we will be seeing more jobs, which means we're creating job opportunities for our people. Remember that AI jobs are not existing jobs. They don't exist before now. You know, we're not talking about agricultural job or computer programming job. These are new set of jobs that were not there, that we're now seeing being created through this collaboration. And it's a, it's a big, big day for, for all of us. Most of the artificial intelligence technology right now, yes, is built in English. But you have other countries as well, you know, China, that are also leading their own efforts. And so what we must do in Nigeria as well is start to lead our own efforts in building artificial intelligence technology. 
But some of the things we can contribute to the table that a lot of other countries are missing is we have a diverse nation already that coexists well together. Experience learning AI so far is that you can actually train your data and your machines to, you can use them and program them in such a way that they would be able to think and reason the way we reason as humans and give us a better outcome. And when we found Awari, when they found us, rather, we found, figured out it's a way for us to put Nigeria on the map as regarding AI. It's a way to tell our story, our African stories, our native Nigerian stories, because we found out that we've not been well represented by the West who developed these technologies originally. The group chief executive officer of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, Mele Kiari, has assured Nigerians that fuel importation will end in 2024. But Speaker of the House of Representatives, Abbas Tajuddin, taxed the company on the privatization of the nation's refineries for more efficiency. Three. Yes, we do have past, uh, no doubt about it, uh, too many issues around our books that we are resolving, but the reality today is that this company is operating like just any other private company that you will see. It's returning value to its shareholders and is focused on its key mandate, which is to create value to for its shareholders. We are selling in the market at the price that we are recovering our full cost from this, uh, this operation. Uh, despite this, uh, foreign exchange transaction is a different ball game, and that is why we are engaging to see that the other private sector may, uh, will come into play in this, in, this, in this market. By the end of December latest, we will start the Potaco refinery. Early in the first quarter of 2023, 2024, we will start the World refinery. And also, by the end of 2024, Cardinal refinery will come into operation. This is the commitment that we are giving, and you can hold us accountable uh, on this. Let us find ways of privatizing our refineries so that they can be active, so that in the near future, they will be able to compete with uh, new refineries like the Dangote that will soon come on board. We will take a quick break. When we return, I will introduce my guest. Thank you for staying with the Hello Chambers. And my guest today is a lawmaker from Lagos State. He is the lawmaker representing a Jeremy Ifello Doom federal constituency in the House of Representatives at the National Assembly. Thank you for joining us on the Hello Chambers today. Thank you very much for it's having good to me. Good have you. Yeah. Thank you. So let's start with um, the recent meeting with service chiefs and the House of Representatives. Of course, we've seen meetings like this with the chiefs in the past. And um, little or nothing is being done concerning the issue of insecurity. Insecurity still persists. What is going to be different this time around? Do, do we see any results coming from this meeting? Uh, thank you very much. A philosopher said, what touches all must be debated by all. The wise who refuses to rule will have the reign of idiots. You have opinion, particularly when you're talking about the lawmakers. Every day in the chambers, we observe a minute silence, you know, in repose of those who have lost their life due to insecurity issues. And so we're getting fed up. And we feel that what should we do? Let's invite the security chiefs, the, I, the IG, and have a dialogue. Mm. What we have just done is a dialogue. And except you keep dialoguing about issues that bother you, that bothers your nation, that bothers your people. And that's where you get a solution. The problem shared is half solved. We are opportuned to express our opinion to the security chiefs who raise fundamental questions as to why insurgency, insecurity, banditry, you know, kidnapping, all of this still persists. And we're all aware that in appointing them, they were appointed out of many. And based on their pedigree, their activities, their performance in the past, so every Nigerian has high hopes on them, feeling very secure that they will take us to the 
promised land. But then the promised land is a long journey. But what seems to be the problem? Could it be funding? Because we've had that come up so many times. Um, the security agencies are being underfunded. They don't have the equipment to confront this insecurity. When you spoke with them or when the House, you know, conversed with these chiefs, what were the major challenges they raised? Like you have alluded, funding is central. It's germane. It's fundamental to one of their basic problems. And then, even after the, 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 the interview session with them, we also had what we call the executive session, where we were able to go down deep some of the issues that could not become a discourse in public. Because issues of this security is not something you discuss in the open. Some aspects are security issues that must kept to their chest. And we shared. I give you examples. The you know, funding is central because every item of the weapon of war is purchased in dollars. Mm. So when you will budget so much money and say, oh, the, the security has taken the largest chunk of the budget. But then when you detonate it into dollars, it becomes insignificant. So they gave us the major component of some of the major instruments of war that they had to purchase. And then when you detonate it into Naira and into dollar, it becomes very insufficient. So funding is central. And like I also alluded to, you know, my own opinion is to the fact that everybody cries foul in terms of funding. If you interrogate the health sector, they say funding is a, a problem. Don't forget, as early as the 60s, when we were very young, we had that song, very melodious song. In the early 60s, we had that song to say that the society is tough. The young are crying. The old are crying. The society is tough. The nation is tough. So, but then, that song still persists till today. The rich young man of yesterday has brought taken his father away from the from the farm. The father now stays in the city. So and then we, we would also have a, a system that does not encourage agriculture. We have clamored for mechanized farming. But you speaking about agriculture, you are aware that this insecurity problem has led to a lot of farmers abandoning their farms because they are, they are afraid of being attacked. And this has also posed a risk to food uh, security. How well do you think this situation can be managed? Okay, I, 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 I tell you something. The major source of insecurity is poverty, is hunger. Is hunger. So we have, you know, what led people into insurgency? Hunger. You understand what I'm saying? So because a society that cannot solve its food issues, its food problem, cannot, what is the difference between us and the developed economies and the developed world? The difference is that when, why people, why do people jack up? Why are they running abroad? It is because you walk from morning till night. They don't have a break. But then they know they can afford to eat three times a, a day. Cheap is the, food is the cheapest thing that you can get anywhere in the developed world. So it is because of hunger that has led to majorly insecurity. Most of these people that are partaking in insecurity are lured by food. So we must attack food issues. I agree with you that banditry has also imp impeded the ability of our farmers to go to farm. And they also, the security chief also discussed with us, you know, some of their challenges when it comes to issues of, you know, having to protect the, 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 the rural farmers. You understand what I'm saying? It's all about weaponry. If your opponent, those who are fighting, they have superior weapons, how is it that we have not been able to block the source of weapons? The, 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 the insurgents also, collect our dollars. Some will kidnap people and they say they don't want Naira, they want dollars. So it's a multifaceted you know, problem. It's not a problem that is isolated to the security agents alone. It says, see something and say something. 
we must also, as a people, be able to expose, give information. Now, if the security agencies are being compromised and even they themselves are not able to handle the situation, what now becomes of the entire problem? You see, this development is a new phenomenon. And problems will erupt and they will keep thinking through until when we get solution. Now this is already exposed. The Minister of Interior is aware. The entire security apparatus are aware. So it means that we have to pay particular attention to our prison yard. So it's not as if it will not go. It will come and go. But then, if, it is not, if the problem is not identified and discussed like we're doing now, it will not become a concern of all and sundry. So it's not a concern of all and sundry. So it means that our warders, our you know, people who work in the prisons must take more interest. Why do people have access to use of telephone? You understand what I'm saying? And they are in the prison. So a lot of lapses. The society is rotten. But then, it's all of us. Those who do it are also from us. People look for employment. They say there is no employment. When they get employment, they are there doing something else again. So it's all about all of us. It's not about the lawmakers alone. It's about all of us. And as we cry out, as we discuss it, and as a, the, the media also advocate and amplify these issues. Also during the week, we saw the NMPC GMD, you know, visit both um, houses, um, both chambers of the National Assembly on the Senate and on the House of Reps. And one of the key assurances he gave um, the people in the House of Representatives was the fact that um, uh, importation of fuel will be ended by next year. It's not the first time that we are hearing such um, promises and assurances. What guarantee should Nigerians hold on to that this time um, the CEO of the NMPC means what he says? Well, it's, it's for him to give, you give a benchmark. You have to make benchmark performance of those in public positions. And except you benchmark them, they don't have, and like the president also said, he said he has appointed a special advisor to monitor all the ministers. It means that they're going to be benchmarked against their performance. So it's a benchmark which all of us are going to continue to measure him. And so we will keep on you know, pushing and ensuring that he can do that. But you also understand that some parameters are already getting in place. The Dangote refinery is coming on stream some of our alien refineries so i don't share the opinion because these refineries have gone turn around to maintain and god knows when how many years and they will keep hearing oh it will come on stream it will come on stream so are you as hopeful as myself but as lawmakers we will continue to be on that trail ours is to ensure that we monitor we perform our oversight functions to ensure that when laws are made, they are, they, are, they are followed to ensure that when resources, when budgets are, are provided for you to execute a particular project, we send out, like we have started our monitoring effort. That's why you see that the various have, you know, committees, standing committees of the House have been constituted and we are sitting day and night to ensure that we also oversee what they are doing. Okay, otherwise, if you don't oversee, everybody will just take the resources and plunder it. So we are, we are very much alive, we are ready. We are we're pragmatic about it. We are very, very optimistic that we do our job. You do your job. I do mine. Everybody does theirs. Then we'll get there. All right. So we'll still have more to discuss on this topic, but we'll take a quick break. Glad to have you back. We're still speaking with Honorable Kalejai Paul. Thank you for staying with us on the program. My We've been pleasure. speaking about... Uh, the visit of the service chiefs and also the visit of the GMD of the NMPC. One major issue that he raised is the problem of crude oil theft. Although he mentioned that it is being brought under control, but you know, the country still seems to still struggle with its daily production uh, of crude. What kind of legislation can the National Assembly innovate to, you know, curb this? kind of problem. Of course, we know that the PIA is already in place, but how effective is this at the moment? To yeah, the I, I, I must give kudos to the president, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, because, you know, before his ascendancy to the position of presidency, the crude oil production was 
quite low. Now it has moved up. We are projecting a greater upward movement of yeah. the production. Well, that's 1.7 so, barrel? That, yes, 1.7 barrel. You know, that's what we are projecting against next year. You see, you cannot include, increase your production if you don't continue to curb theft and all of this. So already it's been addressed by the presidency, but also the House of Reps has also set up an ad hoc committee, you know, specially to address the crude oil theft. And then the committee was inaugurated last week by the speaker, you know, our, our, our own leader, Tajuddin Abbas, who has been very forthright, who has been very concerned about how do we move the country forward, keeping a very united, a very focused, you know, House of Rep Rep Representatives. So he has set up an ad hoc committee to look specifically into the crude oil theft. So it's when you bring those who are culpable to book, that's when you will start having, you know, a second, you know, a redress. So when the House of Representatives looks at the causes of crude oil theft, those who are involved, how much has been stolen, and then you can also bring them to book, bring them before the law, and then the law can you know, take its course. Let's come back to the um, activities of the National Assembly. The National Assembly is about to cross its happier um, mark. What has your experience been like in the House of Representatives? It's been very interesting, very challenging. And I'll tell you, it's interesting and very challenging. Very interesting because, you know, for quite a very long time since I left the cabinet of Lagos State, I've not really been you know, used to regimented life. When I've got to wake up at a particular time and I've got to get to work. And so I've got, just got to retune my routine. Mm -hmm. That has also been very helpful. The hectic you know. or is more relaxed? Because it's, you know, it's Lagos not, is more of the uh, up and running kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, Lagos is up and running. But I tell you that meeting up with the challenges of the house, mm. for instance, you are into two, three, four different committees. Mm. And some of them are sitting almost at the same time. And you want to be at all. So like even yesterday, I was in three committees. Apart from sitting in the hollow chamber, I had to attend three other committees to ensure that I, you know, I make my input. So mm. it's been you know, going up and down. It's been very challenging. Interesting because it's also gave me the opportunity to be able to have a voice for my people. So what makes it different from previous, uh, you know, uh, assemblies? Yeah, it's not as if it's, you know, you know, entirely different. You can only improve on what is good. What is good can be better. What is better can be best. We had a ninth assembly. It had a very good legislative agenda. We have only just improved on what they, what, 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 they, what they have. We're also just looking at some... You know that society is dynamic. What was a problem last year may not be a problem this year. So the way the, the, the Ninth Assembly looked at the legislative agenda may not be the way it is today again because a lot of other developments have taken over, you know, in terms of our nationhood. So what we have just done is to look at some of the shortcomings of the Ninth Assembly agenda improve on it, fine-tune it, particularly in the area of, you know, in the area of, you know, our service to our people, in the area of welfareism, in the area of concern for the society, in the area of also ensuring that we are pragmatic in our approach to solving societal problems. So that's what the legislative agenda is all about. All right. As a representative of a Jeremy fellow do federal constituency, what has it been like representing your people? How have you been able to project the need of your people to the National Assembly to effect effective change to your region? It's been quite good. And I'll tell you, for instance, I'm a proactive person. I don't stay in Abuja. Every weekend, I'm back to Lagos. I'm in the midst of my people. I've opened my constituency office far back two, two and a half months ago. And I've had staff who are working there on a daily basis. I've had an opportunity for people to go there and, you know, drop their complaints. And then they either, you know, send some of them to me while I'm here. Anyone that is urgent, anyone that is not urgent, I can't go there. I interact with people every, you know, Saturday. I'm there in the evening, every Sunday. 
I'm there in the evenings. I'm trying to listen to their complaints. And then beyond that, so I try to look at issues that arise, you know, within the society. For instance, there was a fire, a, a, a fire outbreak in one of the, you know, one of the markets, the plant market in Ifelodu, particularly in, you know, the, 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 the part of my federal constituency. When I got to know it happened on Wednesday by Friday, I was back home. I was there physically. I interacted with them. I inspected what has happened. I came back to the hollow chamber and I moved a motion of urgent importance addressing the issue of the emergencies and asking that the house resolve and the house did resolve that you know the emergency unit the the NEMA move in and try to do some ameliorations and whatever. Well, yes it's not as if oh they have immediately moved in they will deploy logistics they are looking at it but they also have been concerned and they are working out how to also assist the people to recover some of their looted uh, items, uh, some of their burnt items. And then, so it's an interactive thing. So it, it's what legislation is all about, is that people want a legislator that is available. All right, a quick one before I let you go, Honorable. Um, it's beyond 100 days of the Tinubu administration. And looking at um, the performance critically, what can you say about the Tinubu administration so far? Has it performed up to expectation? Have they made, been able to meet up with the promises made? What is your assessment? Honestly, you know, I, I, I belong to the same party with the president. I've also served under him as a cabinet member. So I don't want to look at him from the bias points, mm. but I look at him from the public opinion. Yes. Is not yet an Uhuru. The journey is still a journey. But then, the same morning shows the day. What we have seen from the beginning of this government shows readiness, shows preparedness, shows concern, shows you know dynamism. We have seen that one, he has assembled assembled the right cabinet. He has given them a mandate. He has not just left them aloof. He has given them the criteria would be to work. He himself has been quite up and doing. He can, he is not sleeping. So you're not expecting any of his lieutenant to sleep. So we have seen his various trips abroad. And what is he doing? He's trying because, you know, the societal economy cannot be solved without an external input. So he's been trying to attract some investors to come and invest in our country. Especially now that we have stability, relatively, that, you know, so he's been attracting investors and a lot of promises. He's just, in, you know, in Bel uh, uh, you know, Belgium, you know, to also solicit. So he's been working very hard. So he's on the trail. The journey may still be far, but he's focused. He's prepared. And we can see that. He's going to take us to the promised land. The promised land may be far.